next on the news. My heart goes out for that hard-working, honest New Yorker that was doing his job. They have the mayor's support, but what about the Manhattan DA bodega workers meeting with Bragg today, asking him to drop the murder charges in that deli death? And abortions now states rights, but the Biden administration is saying hospitals must be able to provide them. Plus, that papal trip to Ukraine, it just might happen. Then this. Let me pray that maybe as a priest I might have that same love that he displayed, that passionate love. A look at a new documentary on a man the KKK wanted dead and his lasting legacy in the Diocese of Brooklyn. I'm Michelle Powers. Current News starts right now. It's an investigation gripping the city. Calls are growing louder every day to drop the charges against the Harlem bodega worker who stabbed a man to death after the guy went behind the counter and attacked him. All of New York asking the same question. Was it murder? or self-defense. While Jose Alba's future hangs in the balance, the district attorney's office is continuing to weigh the evidence. But let's take a look for ourselves. You be the judge. A deadly stabbing captured on video. Jose Alba was working at an upper Manhattan bodega on July 1st when police say he got into a fight with another man. According to a criminal complaint, a woman tried to buy a snack for her daughter. Her payment card was declined. She told police Alba reached over the counter and grabbed her daughter's hand to get the item back. She then left, but later returned to the store with her boyfriend, Austin Simon. A criminal complaint says Simon went behind the counter and pushed the bodega clerk. Alba told an investigator Simon wanted him to apologize to the girl. Surveillance video shows Simon attempting to steer the clerk out of the area behind the counter. The complaint states Alba, quote, picked up a kitchen knife that was stashed behind the counter and stabbed Mr. Simon in the neck and chest at least five times. It goes on to say Simon's girlfriend took a knife from her purse and stabbed Alba, who suffered a wound to his arm. Police say Simon died later that evening of stab wounds to his neck and torso. Officers then arrested Alba the next day. He is charged with one count of second-degree murder and has been released on $50,000 bond, partially secured by the owners of the bodega. The case reigniting the debate over self-defense laws in New York. The New York City mayor says he supports Alba. My heart goes out for that hard-working, honest New Yorker that was doing his job in his place of business where a person came in and went behind the counter and attacked him. And my heart goes out to that, uh, that uh, employee who was in the store doing his job. And so I am hoping that we take all of that into consideration as this hardworking New Yorker was doing his job and someone aggressively went behind the counter to attack him. So the DA has his job. In a meeting with bodega workers today, the Manhattan DA said he would not drop the charges just yet, that they are still investigating. Alvin Bragg has been criticized for his controversial progressive policies. Bodega workers say that bail reform is a big problem and they need more protection, saying they feel more unsafe than they did in the 80s. And that's because they practically are. According to statistics from the NYPD, robberies at bodegas have nearly tripled so far this year. 195 thefts have been reported solely at delis so far in 2022. At this point last year, only 75 had been reported. Bodega union reps believe the numbers are even higher because they're underreported, saying owners have lost all confidence in the criminal justice system. Jose Alba broke his silence about the incident on Monday. He said he was trying to protect his life and that he feels bad for Simon's family. He is asking them to please forgive him. Speaking of crime, the Bishop of Brooklyn announced a big reward for information leading to the return of that stolen tabernacle from St. Augustine Church in Park Slope. The company that insures properties in the Diocese of Brooklyn is offering $50,000 to anyone with information on it, in addition to $3,500 put up by the NYPD. 
According to police, sometime during Memorial Day weekend, thieves cut the tabernacle out of its protective casing and destroyed nearby statues before they made off with the tabernacle. The ornate holy sacramental sacramental object was built in the late 1800s and is irreplaceable due to its historical and artistic value. So if you have any information of the tabernacle's whereabouts or have heard anything that could help police, just call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-577-TIPS. The Biden administration is now saying hospitals must perform abortions in emergency situations if it could save the mother's life. After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last month, states can now pass their own abortion restrictions. But the Department of Health and Human Services says to save a woman's life, the procedure is protected under federal law, no matter the law in a particular state. Some anti-abortion advocates are worried this might be abused by those pushing a pro-abortion agenda. Meanwhile, investigations are underway after vandals attacked two pro-life pregnancy centers in Massachusetts last week. One, Clearway Clinic, had its doors and windows shattered, and the words Jane's Revenge were spray-painted on the walkway by the entrance. Those same words were found just two miles away at Problem Pregnancy, which is a crisis pregnancy center. The facility was discovered drenched in blue and gold paint. Those are just the latest examples of violence against pro-life centers and churches. According to the Family Research Council, there have been more than 30 attacks since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last month. Among them, 11 Catholic churches have been vandalized and 15 pregnancy centers, including the two in Massachusetts, were targeted. And while pro-life centers are preparing for more attacks, Brooklyn Bishop Robert Brennan says it's our job as Catholics to promote peace no matter what. And foremost, we must focus on changing hearts and minds. I think one of the things we need to do is to continue those dialogues, to mm -hmm. continue that um, understanding. And, and that provides for the transformation, that change of the culture. Okay. You know, change of law is one thing. Change of the culture, change right. of people's hearts and minds, that's the bigger and more important um, job for us to do. Bishop Brennan went on to say that the pro-life movement must now move forward and enact family-friendly policies that welcome children, support mothers, and cherish families. Ukraine is getting more aid for the United States, $1.7 billion. The money will be used to pay the salaries of healthcare workers still in the country. Most left already, but some remain working in the few hospitals that are still open and haven't been bombed. To date, the United States has given $4 billion in support to the Ukrainian government. Another big supporter, Pope Francis, might just visit the Ukrainian people in person. After months of rumors of a possible trip to the war-torn country, top Vatican officials are now confirming that the possibility of the Pope going to Ukraine is, quote, realistic. Justin McClellan has the story from St. Peter's Square. Pope Francis could travel to Ukraine in August, according to the Vatican's foreign minister, Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher. In an interview, Archbishop Gallagher shared that the Vatican intends to study the possibility of a papal trip to Ukraine upon Pope Francis's return from Canada at the end of July, and that the Pope himself is very convinced that such a visit would have positive results. He confirmed that uh, this possibility of visit is realistic and we really starting to work on this idea. Andriy Yorash is Ukraine's top diplomat to the Vatican. He says his government is working to make the sign of support from the Pope a reality for the country's Catholics and all of its citizens alike. It's not a political visit. It's a spiritual blessing of the country. It will be a gesture from any other people in, in, in Ukraine that the most respectable religious leader of the world is with Ukraine. Pope Francis has publicly expressed his desire to visit Ukraine, but says that first he must travel to Moscow. Yet so far, the Kremlin has denied that any substantial preparations are underway to receive the Pope. If there are two sides, and one is not even willing to uh, shake the hand, other is repeating for many years already its invitation for visit the country, for visit the people, uh, I think it would be absolutely natural 
to support and to accept invitation from that side which is expecting for this exactly we understand spiritual moral uh, help from the apostolic capital that was Justin McClellan reporting the Ukrainian ambassador wants Pope Francis to, to see the destruction of the country with his own eyes and be there to pray with the people for an end to the war. As Justin mentioned, the talks will happen after the Holy Father's upcoming trip to Canada from July 24th to the 29th. But that's not the only thing on the Pope's agenda. He will also preside over the August 27th consistory for the creation of 21 new cardinals. After that, he'll go on a day trip to the Italian town of L'Aquila before an August 29th and 30th meeting with cardinals around the world. And then in September, he will beatify Pope John Paul I on September 4th. He plans to visit Kazakhstan on the 14th and the 15th, and he will visit Assisi and Matera on the 24th and the 25th. So there may be resignation rumors, but that is not on his schedule. There's a lot more news now headed your way. COVID cases on the rise again in the United States. Coming up, the plan the White House says maybe you should get yet another booster. And some relief at the pump. That sounds different, but just how much have those prices fallen? And the summer heat could make certain prescriptions more dangerous for you. How you can protect yourself. might have both your COVID vaccines and a booster, but now the White House is saying it could be time for your fourth shot. The Biden administration is developing a, developing a plan to allow all adults to receive a second coronavirus booster. Some variants of COVID-19 are fueling a rise in cases across the United States, particularly in New York City. Karen Kefa has the latest. White House health officials issuing a dire warning. COVID is mutating again. We have been watching this virus evolve rapidly. We've been planning and preparing for this moment. Living President Joe Biden's coronavirus response team met Tuesday, telling Americans they will need to do more to protect themselves against COVID-19 as a highly transmissible subvariant drives up new infections and hospitalizations across the country. The Omicron offshoot BA5 caused an estimated 65% of new infections in the U.S. last week. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. A closely related strain, BA4, is also responsible for another 16% of infections in the U.S. We do not know yet about the clinical severity of BA4 and BA5 in comparison to our other Omicron subvariants, but we do know it to be more transmissible and more immunivating. Experts say increased hospitalizations are possible and changing subvariants could test immunity. This variant is so unrecognizable to our immune system relative to previous versions of the virus. So that's why gearing up with things like uh, high quality masks and the distancing and air f uh, filtration, ventilation, all these things are important. The White House is also urging Americans to stay up to date on their vaccines, while officials work on a plan to allow second COVID-19 boosters for all adults. While COVID cases are on the rise, gas prices have been falling, maybe just a little, but we can take what we'll get, right? According to GasBuddy.com, the national average for a gallon of gas is currently at $4.65, a significant drop compared to last month when Americans on average paid just over $5 per gallon. New York City is also seeing some relief with the average in the Big Apple now at $4.82 per gallon. But if you're looking to travel, now might be the best time to visit Europe. Because for the first time in two decades, the exchange rate between the euro and the U.S. dollar is roughly the same. It comes after the value of the euro plunged nearly 15 percent since the start of the year, with analysts blaming the drop over fears of recession in Europe and in Russia's war in Ukraine. First responders are trying to gain the upper hand in the battle against a wildfire in Yosemite National Park. The Washburn fire grew to more than 3,200 acres just overnight. Steps have been taken to protect nearby communities and the historic giant sequoia trees, but the weather isn't helping the firefighters. 
hot, hot days are bearing down in the region, making it hard to contain the flames. With the summer heat gripping much of the nation right now, it can be a problem if you're on certain prescriptions. The drugs can make the hot weather even more dangerous. Mandy Gaither has more on how you can protect yourself. A heat wave continues to crash over much of the U.S. and mixing those soaring temperatures with some medications could cause major problems. Sometimes the reaction may take uh, weeks to months uh, for it to fade. Dr. Reza Conroy with the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center says some medications that don't go well with the sun include some antibiotics, antidepressants, antihistamines, anti-inflammatories, and medications for blood pressure and diabetes. For diabetics, Conroy says bring a cooler when you're out as heat can degrade insulin and other medicines. Put the medication, especially insulin, in the cooler and keep it nice, cool and dark. Conroy says sun-related side effects of medications usually develop about 24 to 72 hours after sun exposure and may appear to be an exaggerated sunburn. It looks red, sometimes scaly, sometimes itchy, and sometimes when it's really bad, blisters and spots that resemble hives. When possible, Conroy says to take the medicine before bed instead of in the morning and follow the sun smart steps, slip on clothing that covers the body, slop on SPF 15 to 30 or higher broad spectrum water resistant sunscreen, slap on a hat, seek shade and avoid the sun between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and slide on sunglasses with UV protection and side panels. I'm Mandy Gaither. All right, we'll have to be careful out there, but still to come on Currents News, he's a major figure in the history of the Diocese of Brooklyn. Next, the new documentary on the man the KKK wanted dead, Monsignor Bernard Quinn and the drive to make him a saint. Monsignor Quinn should be remembered as the person who started the civil rights movement right here in, in the Brooklyn Diocese. Here's a man who understood, identified early in his life as a priest, the need to reach out to African Americans, people of color. He recognized that as a real need in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Father Quinn had a great love of the Lord. And because of his love of the Lord, he loved the African American people because he found Jesus in them. One of his lasting legacies is he's really for us a driving force to promote and defend the rights and equality of all people. He was willing to sacrifice his life as a young priest to serve the marginal. He saw something that was missing, and that became his ministry. He was a seed that grew and grew. The seed has reached around the world. Monsignor Quinn, Servant of God, a must-see documentary airing on Net TV. If you haven't seen it yet, now is the time. He's already considered a saint by many, and his legacy carries on today around the diocese and in the parish he founded for African American Catholics. Joining us now is Monsignor Paul Jervis, the Brooklyn priest who has been spearheading Quinn's cause for canonization. Monsignor Jervis, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so this documentary has been years in the making, and you've been the postulator for the cause. It's been your life work for about 25 years now. Why did you decide to take up this cause? Once I had gotten to know about the life of Monsignor Quinn as a young priest uh, so many years ago, St. Peter Claver, I was convinced, you know, that the world needed to know about this priest who had such an extraordinary love of the Lord um, for his black uh, brethren, mm -hmm. and not only his black brethren, but also everyone as well. Once I read his own words in which he said that he was willing to shed the last drop of his life blood for the lees of his brethren, I was just totally astounded. I said, oh my God, I said, <laughs> This guy has to be a saint. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And let, let's talk a little bit about him. You know everything there is to know about him, but some people may not know that much. So let's get some facts. He established St. Peter Cleaver, which was the first church for black Catholics in sure. Brooklyn. He also founded Little Flower Orphanage for black children, sure. which was actually burned down by the KKK, I think, three times. Yes. Um, so life wasn't easy for Monsignor Quinn, but why do you think he was such a champion for equality? He lamented the fact that at that particular time, you know, that the church was quiet about their civil rights and society um, discriminated, you know, against African Americans openly. So he felt that um, as a priest, um, he had to take he had to take their cause. Right. Let's talk about the time when he was ministering to the diocese. We're not talking about the civil rights movement. We're talking way before then, the 1920s, 1930s, over racism. Were there threats against his life when he said, "I, I would I would drop the last blood for them"? So there must have been threats against his life. Uh, sure. He had a head-to-head -head, uh, confrontation with with the clan because the clan, um, they were determined that the orphanage um, would not be established in Waden River um, because Waden River at that particular time um, was considered uh, to be off limits, you know, uh, to, to blacks and African Americans. So Father Quinn um, courageously stood up to the clan and they, um, and after the second time they had um, burned down the orphanage, um, they, they, they made threats on his life. Mm -hmm. And he was not afraid. And now we, we hope everyone will watch this documentary. But you told me you have watched it yourself. And what, what do you think the biggest takeaway? If someone's watching this for the first time, what do you want their biggest takeaway to be of Monsignor Quinn? And if you could change anything in the film, what would it be? I would not change anything I think the documentary uh, really brings out the fact that Father Quinn was truly a champion of Negro of African American rights he was a priest who was madly in love with the Lord mm -hmm. and it was a spillover of his love for the Lord that that, that was that he gave, you know, to African American, you know, his famous words that he was he would be willing to shed the last drop of his life's blood. But it's important for people to understand. He said he was on fire, and when I read those words, I said, "Oh my God!" I said, "There's nothing can stop this priest, this, this man." And from nothing did. And nothing did. <laughs> so it's in but incredible. my team, you told me maybe it should have been a little longer. <laughs> I would agree. I would absolutely agree because it is so good that you want to keep watching. You want to keep <laughs> watching. You want to keep watching. All right, Monsignor Jervis, we cannot wait to see it. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> I am delighted <laughs> being here. And again, it's not too late to see Monsignor Quinn, Servant of God. Just tune into Net TV on Monday, July 18th, right after Current News at 7.30 or on Saturday, July 23rd at 4 o'clock. And that is Current News. I'm Michelle Powers. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time. Uh -huh.